he looked young, he did look young, but it was after the, the marriage that I knew that he was twice my age, so I was 15, he was 30. I knew, I knew he was gonna rape me, and that's what happened, and it, it became like every single day. What was your childhood like? Where did you grow up? Um, so my family, well, my mum and my dad were from Bangladesh. Um, they grew up there and they came over in the 70s. Um, I had, I've got two older, brother, uh, two older brothers, one older sister, and there was another younger brother after me. And then there was like my younger, younger brother. There was a big gap and they were like babies. My older sister, she started dating somebody. She actually said, said to my dad, you know, I want to get married to this boy, you know, I'm in love with him, been with him for a couple of years. It was all kept hush hush, you know, it was a very big secret. So for her to tell my family was a massive thing for her, but it wasn't accepted. She ran away, um, we didn't know where she was, but that impact brought such a tremendous eruption of a volcano and it affected everybody in their family. So when your sister left the house with her boyfriend, what happened to you after that? We were a poor family, even though there were so many of us, we, we grew up very poor. Um, never been on holiday, never could even go to the next town because that's how poor we was. So it was only about a couple of weeks after that. Funnily enough, my father's got tickets for everybody and we're going to Bangladesh and I'll be like, oh, okay. I thought we couldn't afford to do anything like this. But I think all my extended family paid for the tickets, you know, because as you can imagine, the honor affected them, the shame affected them as well, where they needed to regain their honor. And they thought by this ripple effect, they can take me to Bangladesh and get me married off. Who was the guy you were set to marry? So, so the way that it was set up, I mean, we lived in the city and my father would keep going away like to the village and coming back. I mean, he had little businesses everywhere and he was going to all these places to find someone to obviously suit me. The first time I remember seeing this person was, um, there was a, outside, our, our house was quite big, it was like a mansion and there was a veranda and there was a stained window and I remember my mum just saying, oh, um, she, she like, showed me the, the guy, she just tapped on the window and she goes, that's the guy that you're gonna be getting married to. And I was like, what? You know, it, it was like, it was, it was a bit crazy and I couldn't understand it. How did it make you feel? Numb, angry, everything at the same time. It's like if, if you can be numb and angry and outraged. Did you have a chance to speak to your future husband before the wedding? No, not really. I think my parents were too afraid for me to say anything. Uh, for me, they were afraid of me of saying something and probably tarnishing it in some way, which I probably would have. The wedding was massive. It was like you see in the Bollywood movies, you know, there was like hundreds and hundreds of people there. I mean, my family were, you know, we were quite poor in this country. Over that country, we were quite wealthy. Um, I remember being in my room, I was drenched in gold and, you know, a sari and everything. And I remember sitting there and I didn't want to come out of my room knowing that, oh, there's another man there that I don't even know. And his whole entire family is here um, celebrating, laughing, joking. You know, you could, you could smell all the amazing food that they were cooking. And, you know, it's, and you, I'm just sat there in my room just thinking, wow, I'm just this little China doll that, that's been all pampered up and he's gonna to get to married to this stranger. Um, I remember his sister like knocking on my door and like trying to get a peep for this new bride, you know, that their brother's gonna get married to. And it was, it, it was just numbing. It was like a, I knew there was a horror story coming and it was just like in my brain, you know, when it's slowly, slowly coming along and you're like, oh, the music's getting more intense. That's how it felt. I mean, a lot of people at this point would be like, well, why didn't you say something? Why did you not go to the police? Why did you not scream out, shout out? You cannot do that over there. But you can't get out there, you can't go out. Because, first of all, you wouldn't know where to go. Second of all, people will just bring you back to the house, 
because eyes are everywhere. And third of all, you wouldn't even know what to say because it's normal out there. I remember asking one of my uncles who was more or less my age, and you know, which is a bit weird with the age differences, but he was my uncle and I asked him, I said, what happens to girls when they say no and they shout out and they scream out? He would tell me things like, oh, you'd get taken to the village and locked up in this little cellar. So I had to keep this all like thinking to myself, right, Rubes, just, just pace out the way that they want to. When you get home, you can do whatever you want. When you get home, you can do what you want. And that's all I had to repeat to myself. I mean, for a 15 year old to be thinking that way, you, you got to imagine how much of a deep end I was in and it was how much I was drowning to be thinking that sharp and thinking, right, this is what I've got to do just to get out of that place. And I had to go with it. I had to pretend. How did your parents feel seeing you that upset at your own wedding? My mother never wanted it to happen, never. She, but she's a woman, she's silenced. She's not allowed to speak in that country, you know. And she, it was heartbreaking for my mum because I could see her, I could see her breaking. My father was acting very, like, like, a, like as if he wasn't acknowledging what was happening, but then trying to make sure that everything goes to plan. But I remember there was one point where I got placed sitting next to this husband and I saw my father and I, wanted, I was crying and I wanted to just look at my father's face because I was daddy's girl and I wanted him just to make that connection with me. And he did. And I, I saw tears coming down his eyes and I thought, where's that dad? You know, where is he? Why is he not saving me? I remember after the wedding, I did, my personality did start seeping out and my anger started to seep out. And I remember like making a few snidey comments here, there and everywhere. But by that time it was too late anyway. I knew, I knew who was gonna rape me and that's what happened and it, it became like every single day. And that was very tough to kind of go through. Um, he, was, he looked young, he did look young, but it was after the, the marriage that I knew that he was twice my age, so I was 15, he was 30. Going through the rape every single day, like I said, I had to disconnect myself. I had to just, where I took myself, and this is very personal, it's like I took myself to the beach. In my head, I was on a beach because that's, I grew up next to a beach. I love being by the sea. And that's my, that's my zen place. And I used to take myself there and my brain is like, whatever's happening to my body's happening. But my brain would be elsewhere. And that's how I kept myself alive. But when after he's done, I remember going to the bathroom and just sitting under the shower for like an hour and just cleaning my, trying to clean every single part of me off so I don't smell him on me. And it, 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 was, it was horrible because I would sit there just crying because that's when it will hit me. So when I'm in my zen place, I'm in my zen place, but when I'm gone to wash myself, it, it will just hit me really hard and I'll be like, just crying. And I've got to keep this away from everybody. I can't tell anybody. I've got no one to talk about it to, nobody. And I would just, just let my tears flow with the, with the shower. And that's where I went down the drain. I think from day one, I, I numbed myself out thinking I was pregnant. I just thought, nah, I'm not pregnant. Nah, it can't be happening. I remember everybody celebrating and they were like, oh yeah, she's, you know, we're all gonna have a little grandson and grandson, that's what they wanted. So how old were you when you got pregnant? I was, I just turned 16. And when I got pregnant, I became really, really sick. It wasn't morning sickness, I mean, my mum's had eight of us, she knows what morning sickness is. But it was, it was to the point where I kept on vomiting violently. Um, there would be blood coming up. I started to lose weight rapidly. I lost two stones in that two weeks. Um, couldn't keep anything down. And I, I just, you know, I was a slim girl, you know, and I looked like a bag of bones back then. And it was horrible. I, I didn't know what was happening. I just thought that's what pregnancy is. But my mum knew it wasn't that. I knew I was gonna die and that's how it felt. And I thought, right, well, if this is happening to me, let it happen to me because I didn't really care at that point. 
I knew that was my deathbed and it was to the point where my mom, I, she made that phone call to my dad and she said to my dad, she's gonna die if we don't get tickets coming back home. And as soon as my mom said, we've got the tickets, uh, I kind of like thought, right, I'm, I'm that close to going home now. Whether I make it or not, I'm still that close to going home. I think as soon as I got back home, everything just hit me. All the, all the pretending that I did, every single emotion that I tried to put, push away, and it's like my soul and my body just snapped back into place, and I, I tried to commit suicide, and I, I just couldn't take it. It's like everything, every memory, everything just hit me like, a, like an explosion. I don't like this body that I'm in. I don't like what's happened to me. I don't like what they've done to me. I don't like carrying this raped child. That's how I used to think. And I don't want none of it. It's like everything was dictated for me. The day after, when I, I was admitted to hospital on the day after, this one nurse, and you know, I really can't remember her name, but she was like an angel. She came to me, you know, when, when my mum and dad went home, she came to me and she said, you want an abortion, don't you? And I said, yeah. And it was like the first time somebody spoke to me with respect, like my opinions mattered. Like it was amazing, such an amazing feeling. It was like, you know what, I'm worth something. You know, I actually felt good for the first time that somebody wanted to listen to me. And then the next day when it was scheduled, to, for me to, you know, so they were gonna give me an appointment after the scan. I saw my daughter's heart beating and I just thought, oh, I can't do this. And I, I thought, I don't care where, how she was made, but she's got me now. She's got this strong person right here carrying this baby. And I thought, I'm gonna put my everything into my daughter. How was your daughter when she was born? So, um, my pregnancy with my daughter was quite, was quite a slow one. You know, she, she was three weeks early, three pound 13. She was the size of a doll, plastic dolls you can buy from the shops. That's how size, big she was. I didn't even get to have two minutes with my daughter because she was taken straight away to special care unit. I just saw her big eyes and she made a little noise like a little cat and then they took her straight away. So I didn't really have that, you know, vital bonding time with her. I just thought, Okay, so I kind of started disconnecting before any trauma would happen, because that's the only way that, that was my co coping mechanism started kicking in. It's like my survival mode was like, right, something bad's gonna happen, right, disconnect, disconnect. And that's just what I started to do when she was in, she was in special care unit for two months. The only way that I could touch her was through, if I incubated, if I can feed her, put my hands through the um, gloves. And it wasn't nice, because I was coming back home then without a baby, without the balloons and the cards, and that was horrible. It was horrific. When she did finally came back, I, I, I still took me a long time to bond with her. I don't think I bonded with her until she was about three. And that's me being a horrible mom, but also a mom was trying to survive with postnatal depression and, you know, traumatic, going through all these traumatic events. You know, it's like you're trying to keep yourself sane, but at the same time, you can't give any love to anybody else because you can't love yourself. What was happening between you and your husband after you gave birth? So throughout the pregnancy, throughout when I came back from Bangladesh to the UK, um, he would make phone calls, he'd write letters and things like that. Now, the reason why he wrote letters and, you know, keeping that communication is so when, when my family or, and his family, like, combinedly sponsored him to come as my spouse to the UK, it would show there's still communication, there's still letters being exchanged, there's that, you know, oh, their marriage is good. That's how clever they were. Like, my, my father and my uncles would write letters on my behalf and send it back to him because I wouldn't write anything. I won't say, I won't write a love letter to somebody I don't love, you know? Why would I do that? There was um, plans about me moving to Bedford so then I can go and be the wife, the cook, the cleaner, the slave and produce more babies. And I knew that would 
that would have been my second move from out of my family's home because I've seen it happen to my cousins. I'm not gonna be those trapped women who cannot speak. And it, you know, I'm in my home country now. I'm gonna bloody speak. I'm gonna say everything that I can when the moment's right, but I need to get myself out of this city. And that's what I did. So I then, I remember running out of the house while my father was in work because I wasn't allowed to go on the phones or anything like that. I wasn't allowed to go to the shops. And I remember seeing one of my school friends walk across the road because we lived on the main road and all the shops are there. So when I saw her, I ran out of the house and I ran across the road and I said, you have to help me. I need to get out. She, she was like, Rubes, you know, I haven't seen you in ages. You know, I see you with your mom, da, 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 da. You know, everywhere I went, even in the UK, was chaperoned. You know, she'd be like, I've seen you with your mom in town. I'm like, yeah, but I couldn't really go up to her and talk to her like a human being and just have a private conversation. So she goes, come back to my house and my parents will help you. They only lived around the, like two streets away. Went to her house and I told them everything. It took them six hours to actually then get a female officer to come to the house. And I went to my parents' house. I went in the house and at that, by that time, I had my uncles and aunties there. As soon as the door opened up, they were snarling at me. They were whispering, giving me dirty looks. And I heard it all and I you know, felt it all, felt like I was just in this dark cave, just going up the, up the stairs going to get my baby, grab a few bags, uh, clothes in a bag, and I walked out of the house. And that's all I had. So my next move was just latch myself onto anybody, and that's what I did. I latched onto a, a man that I met, and he was a lot older than me, and I, I saw him as my ticket out. That's what, that's what brought me to the Midlands. Can you tell us a little bit about your relationship with that man and yeah. where it took you? So with this new relationship that I thought it was a golden ticket out, at the time he was 28, I was 16. And I was just, yeah, I just, just, no, I was 16, 17. And I thought he, I was so dysfunctional, so I attracted a dysfunctional person, basically. And he lost his child two years before of bone cancer. And she was seven years old. So he was, you know, just going along with his depressed life. And he saw a damsel in distress and he took it. And I took it as well. And that's how it happened. Uh, we connected on some crazy level, thinking that he would give me a better life because that's what he promised me. And then he became a perpetrator where I actually experienced 10 years of domestic violence. I didn't go out of the house for five years. I was not allowed to go to the shops. I wasn't, if I had to desperately go to the shops when he's not there, he would make sure that I was timed. And if I was late coming back when he calls the house line and I don't pick it up, I would get battered. It, it just, it, I found out that he was on drugs. He was on heroin and he would go out for like three days days and nights at a time, I wouldn't be allowed to go anywhere because I didn't know the world and I didn't want to go outside because I was so scared and petrified of people. And I remember getting, we didn't have no money because he was, he was a heroin addict. We, I didn't have no money and I remember the odd pound or two there that he would give me. I will go and get a bag of chips and put it on top of the heater, eat half in the morning and eat half in the night. At that time, my daughter was not feeding, so she was just, you know, on milk, breast milk, and that's how I lived. And that's me, you know, 17 years old, living like a poor person, homeless person, which I was. And then it was in that flat, I got pregnant with his son, and he used to beat me throughout my pregnancy. Um, I remember at one point, where I he used to tell me, oh, you're horrible, you, you, you know, you're disgusting, you're this, you're that. And at that time, I still never had any contact with my family. So I was all alone in this perpetrator's world. And I remember I had nails and I scratched my face. I scratched it till it bled. And I looked in the mirror. This is after him beating me up and I was holding my pregnant stomach. And I was looking in the mirror and I was going, 
you, you're horrible. I was just, I was taking all the abuse that he was saying out through, through my mouth and I was saying it to myself because I believed it. Then soon it came to a point where I actually made the ultimate choice of leaving was when my daughter was about a year old at that time. And I just had my son and my daughter had um, hearing tests because her development, because she was born with special needs, but they didn't know what kind of special needs she was born with. So it was time will tell. So at that time they were doing a lot of hearing um, tests. So I met this girl through this play group for children who have got hearing difficulties. And she started seeing the bruises on my face and everything. She started giving me the encouragement and strength. She took me into her world and I thought, oh, this is what it feels like to have friends. So when and how did you find strength to turn your life around? So um, from leaving that perpetrator and moving on with my son and my daughter, I did end up in dysfunctional relationships for a good six, seven years. It's all I knew. I was in my early 20s, you know. I wanted to do what every other 20-year-old, 20s were doing, which was living life. But obviously I couldn't do that because I had two children. Because I wasn't fixing myself, going to the core of the problem to fix myself. I kept on attracting negativity all the time. And then there was this um, article that was released about this girl who was a model and she committed suicide. And it was like as if it was my life reflecting back at me. And I thought, oh my God, she actually did it. She went and you know, she killed herself. And it just took me back a bit. And I thought to myself, I tried to do that. And I'm so glad I didn't succeed. Because now is my changing point. This, and I felt like the universe just swallowed me up and said, this is your calling. So I got in touch with the charity that commented in this on a killing. And I told them about my story and they asked me to go in and I became an ambassador for them. I started talking about my experiences and then I started to find my platform. And I started to find that people would just attract to me and be like, they want to tell me stuff about their lives. And I'm like, oh, OK, I'm feeling there's a pattern here. And then I just grew on from that. And I work with people overseas, with charities overseas. And I you know, work with home office, place professionals that need to be educated in what honor abuse is and what honor killings is. Because it is a crime. Now, sometimes it is very difficult because we're conditioned from such a young age, we, we might not even know that it's an, it's an abuse because in most cultures, they bury it into your head since you're born, basically, that women, have got, and, women and men have got to do what their parents tell them to do. You have to speak out because it is a criminal offence. I understand a lot of people do not want to take their families down police stations, get them, you know, arrested. But the thing is, whether it's your family or a friend, it doesn't really matter because they're abusing you. They took my childhood and my teen life away from me and majority of my 20s. And it's, I'm 38 now and I've only started to live since I was 30. And I make it this, I'm only eight years old just like the eight-year-old Ruby. And, you know, and that's where I'm going back to. I'm living my life and I've got to do things for me. What's the point of doing things for everybody else when it gives you no satisfaction? Especially in a life partner. Love should be so beautiful. It should be your own choice, not what other people think who you should love and who you should have children with. It's your choice. Whilst everybody was having their orgies, free love sex, they would no longer be permitted to enjoy the sex for each other. They had to fantasize that they were actually having sex with Jesus, um, men included. 